Welcome back to ESC 315. This is lecture five, scoping and terms of reference. This lecture is all about how we determine what needs to be included in an environmental impact assessment. I'm using the recording from last year again. I've shortened it a little bit and updated some parts at the end to reflect newer guidance documents from the BC Environmental Assessment Office. And I want you to pay attention to three documents that I've put on Canvas. That's the EAO user guide, which is listed under resources. And then under lecture five, I've put a link to the application information requirements that I go through later in this lecture and the site CEIS guidelines, which I also go through at near the end of this lecture. I've also linked to the Ross paper, which is quite interesting and informative. Have a look at all of these sources. You don't need to read all of these documents, but look at the sections that deal with how valued components are selected and how we decide which ones we care enough about to base an environmental impact assessment on them. Okay, with that, here's the lecture. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to lecture three. Lecture three is kind of interesting. We're gonna be talking about scoping. And scoping is sort of like a little mini assessment that you do at the start of the project to understand what are the things we need to understand in more detail. So a few things to talk about before that. I'm going to list a few more sources of information and a little sort of random thoughts on critical thinking. Talk about project screening, which is actually the step before scoping, uh, but project screening is a very sort of mechanical process. There's not a whole, whole lot to it. Uh, scoping will be the bulk of this lecture and at the end of scoping generally uh, the government or another agency will come up with a terms of reference that really says this is exactly what the EIA needs to include and then from there disciplines are formed. Kevin Hanna was nice enough to provide me a couple more textbooks. Uh, the one on the left I've been reading and it's quite good in terms of giving us the information we need for this course. Uh, so I'll be following that one, at least for this lecture. It's available in the library, and I've got a copy if anybody wants to have a look at it. The one on the right's not bad. It's based out of the UK, so you sort of have to pull the pieces that you need from it. Uh, but the one on the left is kind of what I'm following today. And then, of course, there is a lot of primary literature out there on EIAs. There's not a whole lot of how-to, uh, but there are some really good... Uh, documents like the one show, I've shown in the middle here. And this is written by a gentleman named Bill Ross, who incidentally taught me uh, many years ago. He teaches at the university, or he taught at the University of Calgary. I'm not sure if he's still there. But he's also the chair of joint review panels. So he's the person that ultimately is the decision maker in a lot of big uh, projects. And a joint review panel is a panel that's set up, panel of experts set up jointly by a province and a government to make a decision on behalf of both the province and the country in terms of whether or not a project is in the public interest. So he's got some interesting, interesting commentary in that paper. Um, I've quoted some of it in this slide deck. Um, and then another source of information that you may want to look at is case studies. Um, there's my case study on the right. Um, there aren't that many published case studies. A lot of EIAs are what is known as gray literature. In other words, large volumes of uh, do documenting scientific works that are not through the formal peer review process, although they actually do go through a separate review process, quite a rigorous one. But if they're not a journal paper, they're known as gray literature. So there's a lot of uh, different EIs out there on the CEA website and BC Assessment Office website. Uh, and then a few in the published literature. And so having a look at some of those will almost certainly help you do your assignment if, if you choose to use them. A really good uh, source of information is the BC Environmental Assessment Office. Uh, so I came to BC about seven years ago. I'd rarely worked in BC before that, and so I wasn't used to having such a good government website. Uh, but ever since then, I've found Almost everything you need to do in environmental assessment, um, the BC government has some decent guidance documents uh, that will help you sort of get it right. And how many people here have taken a law course, environmental law or some other law? How many? Okay, a couple. Um, basically, the difference between laws, regulations, guidance documents, and that, you may have seen this kind of triangle before, sort of the uh, hierarchy of 
of uh, government regulations. So at the bottom we have laws and acts, and these are done by parliament or our MLAs and provincially. Um, and these are essentially uh, a legislated document that spells out a lot of penalties, a lot of must do this, must do that. If not, you can get fines or prisons or any, any sort of uh, that type of information. Uh, attached to most laws are regulations that give a lot of specific information about how a law needs to be followed. So a good example of that is under the Fisheries Act, there's a regulation called the Metal Mining, Metal and Diamond Mining Effluent Regulation. The law specifies what is allowed and what is not allowed, but the regulations give a lot of detail around that. So for example, the regulation will say, uh, here's a list of contaminant concentrations that can never be exceeded by any mine in Canada, and there's an appendix of that. There's a, another appendix in that regulation that says, if a mine is discharging, here is the specific monitoring that the government needs to do, or sorry, that the government needs to see in order to understand whether there are laws being broken. So these are just a lot of details around the laws. The next is a policy. And these are done from within a ministry. So example, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans administers these laws and regulations, but within that department they'll have policies that give guidance to their internal people that says, here's what you must do in order to make sure that a, pro a proponent is following all these laws. And they're sort of high level, they're not a lot of detail. And the next level for the detail is a guidance document. And these are very specific. So the guidance document has to follow the policy, it has to follow the regulations and laws, but these, this is where you get into a lot of detail that says, Step one, step two, step three, follow all of these specific steps. Give us the specific information. It's, it's extremely detailed. We're gonna go through some of these today. And then we have things like user guides. So these are legally binding. If you break one of these, you can go to jail. For example, the Fisheries Act says if you deposit a deleterious substance into a river, you can face a million dollar fine and two years in prison. So they're really, you know, this is really serious stuff. Uh, the policy really doesn't have a direct effect on a lot of people outside of the, uh, outside of the ministry itself. Uh, but the guidance documents are something that we need to follow. And if you don't follow the guidance document, you're not breaking the law. The consequence of not following this is usually that the government will send it back to you and say, go redo this and follow our guidance document. And then the user guides, which we'll also have a look at today, are really just general information that kind of gives you some you know, general guidance on how to do things. It's not very specific, but it, it kind of helps you work your way through all of these other things. So it's, it's important to know which of these we need. So essentially, these are absolute musts if you're working in, an, in the environmental field, obviously. Uh, and these are sort of good to know. Uh, the more of those you know, the better job you can do. So start with the uh, main website. I'll just go there quickly and give a quick look about what's there. Um, and one thing I will note is that the website is now updated for the 2018 Act. When we're looking back at Site C for the case studies, that was, uh, was, a, was a previous Act. So the Act is now further ahead than what we actually need to look at in our case study. So be aware of that. It doesn't make a huge amount of difference, but there are some small things. Uh, and so within this website, you can open the user guide. And so this is the EAO user guide. And it gives you a lot of sort of general information about what needs to be in an EA or an EIA, how the process works, some of the um, review considerations, and really how it ends with the decision and then follows up into compliance and enfor enforcement after the certificate is issued. So these are quite useful. I won't go through the whole thing, but uh, just wanted everyone to be aware that these are out there. And for a fair number of things in your case study, you'll want to have a look at those documents. There's also a project document library where you can look up uh, previous and existing uh, environmental assessments of all types. So if you wanted to look up Site C, I'm sure it's on there, I haven't looked. Um, but if you wanted to look up a similar EIA for comparison, which would be a useful exercise, 
there are lots, there's actually a lot of dams in BC. You can kind of compare this, the scope and scale of a given project to another one and see how it was done and see if there were things done either better or worse than one or the other. Uh, it's just a useful source of info. I also wanted to add a brief, no, brief note on terminology. Um, I'm sure this is not the only field like this, but this, this field is quite annoying in that there's a lot of different terms for the same thing. So for example, uh, Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency says valued ecosystem component, BC says valued component. Uh, most provinces use EIA, Northwest Territories use EIS. Um, most jurisdictions use table of importance, BC uses information requirements table, but they're exactly the same thing. And so if I'm kind of throwing these terms around and you're wondering if this, if this, if one thing is the same as another, just stop me and let me know because I tend to uh, use a lot of terms interchangeably, but I will try and use the specific terms that BC Hydro used and the government used for them because if you're trying to look up a document, for example, if I say the site C EIS, it'll say EIS right on the, right on the uh, document name. And so you'll need that to be able to look it up. Same with, um, actually, I can't remember the name, but, but it's coming up. There's a few other documents I'm going to refer to, and I'll give the actual name that they used, even though it's not the name you would use most of the time. I want to talk about critical thinking. It's really important in EIA. Of course, it's absolutely necessary as a scientist. Uh, but in, in, in EIA, it's actually... Uh, a, even more important because everybody comes into an EIA with some thoughts and opinions. Often the, the opinions are sharply divided between stakeholders and it's very difficult to understand uh, the difference sometimes between opinion and fact and you know preconceived uh, opinions. So you really need to question everything. The most important time to question something is when it's something you already believe because that's where we run into confirmation bias. And confirmation bias is a real killer. If you go into a project with some sort of a, a preconceived opinion about what it looks like, you're probably gonna do a terrible job because you're gonna believe the things you already believe when you see the facts and your mind will automatically uh, tend to oppose the things you don't already believe. And that's just human nature, that is a universal. Uh, but it's really important in EIA where the opinions are really sharply divided and we have to really just stick to the facts. So there are a few ways to deal with that. Number one is be really transparent. If you put all your data, all your analysis, everything down on paper, um, it's really difficult to then be accused of hiding something or of sort of skewing an opinion, which does happen in the EIA a lot. It also keeps you honest. It's difficult for yourself to follow down some crazy path if you know that everybody in the world has access to this document in, in the end, which is actually the case for most EIAs. They're going to end up on the government websites and everybody in the world can look at it. So knowing that every, everyone on, everybody else on earth can come back and reanalyze this actually really is a good uh, tool to keep the, pro, the practitioner honest. And I'm not, I'm not accusing practitioners of being dishonest, but just of falling into the trap of confirmation bias. Um, there's also a lot of tools that can support objective decision making. We're going to go through those in about a month. Uh, but essentially all they are is they're a tool to document the decision that's made and to show all of the thought process that went into it. So um, I'll just start with a kind of a little weird story. So when I was at the University of Lethbridge, I started off taking management, which I dropped after one semester, but that's another story. Um, Within about a week of university, there was a poster sale, and I, I was sort of drawn to this poster. In fact, I liked it so much I had it turned into a plaque. And it's always kind of stuck with me throughout my career. I've always felt like that little frog there is my hero because he's challenging authority. And he's putting his hand up, and he's going, bullshit. And it just occurred to me as I was looking up at it the other day that I, now I'm the other frog. But I want to encourage you guys to kind of channel the energy of that little frog there. So I have a challenge for you. And in fact, I have an incentivized challenge. If at any point you feel like something is BS, put your hand up and say BS, and I'll give you a $10 gift card of your choice. Or if you want to be more polite, you can just say, can you cite your source on that? Anyway, so I have difficulty trying to get people to speak up in class, but hopefully, <laughs> a little incentive. If you challenge me on something, come up and grab that. And if, 
doesn't matter if I'm right or you're right, that's not the point. The second point of that though, there's more to it than that, is that happens a lot in EIA and you have to defend your work. And I want to so sort of show you examples of that. So if you hear something that sounds a little bit off, just ask me to cite my source. And I will have to either cite a, a journal reference or case study or some sort of authoritative source or withdraw my statement. Or I can say subject to check, which is what we do often, and I'll go back and look up the proper reference. But pretty much anything I say, I should be able to cite my source. Um, again, it's not about who's right and who's wrong, it's really just get in the habit of challenging people. Okay? Another, another sort of oddity here is the paradox of defensibility. That's just a term I made up, but it is a real paradox. So anything that goes into an EIA, and again, this really applies to any scientific endeavor. So if you're not planning to be an EIA practitioner, this really does apply to any kind of science you might want to do. It needs to be scientifically defensible. And what that means is it's backed by data, evidence, and the scientific method. If you have assumptions, and we always have to have assumptions when we're doing any sort of scientific work, every every scientific endeavor has some assumptions about the system we're working with. And the point is to just really clearly lay out those assumptions. People can argue with them, they might not agree with them, but if you've got some valid reason for making that assumption, lay it out and be very transparent. The worst case scenario is that you make some assumptions, you do your work, you submit it, and again, I'm talking just generally in science, not necessarily in EIA, but you've made a bunch of assumptions, you haven't communicated, and everybody looks at it and goes, this doesn't make any sense because I don't understand what they've assumed for, you know, is it a closed system? Is it, you know, what are their boundaries? It just, it's hard for people to make sense of if you're not really explicit about your assumptions. Another way is using multiple lines of evidence. And in most scientific endeavors that we do, we can have multiple independent lines of evidence that we can use to draw us to the same conclusion if it's the right conclusion. And so I, I usually try and go with about three lines of evidence. And for me, that might be a model, some monitoring data, and maybe an, anal an analogous study. So if somebody else built a dam somewhere else, I can look at what happened with that dam, that's one line of evidence. I can do a model of the dam that we're trying to study, that's a line of evidence. And I can go out and actually measure things right now. And if all of those lines of evidence tell us the same story, we can have some decent confidence that our work is scientifically defensible. Uh, there's another concept that comes up a lot. Now this is fairly specific to EIA and that's a conservative assumption. So we want to always overestimate risks. In other words, if we think there's a 50-50 chance of a significant adverse impact, that's not a very high level of confidence. Uh, if we think there's a 5% chance, that's still not very good. The problem is, is that it's going to be an arbitrary decision of when we're looking at a large data set, where do, we, where, do we, where do we pick our best guess from? Is it the 95th percentile or the 99th? In some work that I do, we use the 99.91 percentile, which equates to an exceedance of some threshold one day every three years, which is, it's a, it's a US EPA thing, but for, for a very high risk, acute risk, that's kind of their tolerance level. So the paradox is, is that we need to defend our work and we can defend our work using any kind of scientific lines of evidence that we have. We need to subject our work to scrutiny and that's scrutiny by regulators, stakeholders, often people who are in high opposition to what we're doing. Um, but the danger is that we can fall into this design and defend approach. Somebody's designed something, we've assessed it, we think it's fine, now we're kind of entrenched in this, yes, it's all fine, we've checked it out, our work is solid, there's no problem. But the problem there is it totally pre precludes any sort of meaningful consultation if you become entrenched in your position. So that's a really fine line that I think probably just experience is the only way to learn what is that right level of defending your work. So, okay, so back to actual factual stuff. Uh, so screening. So I'm just going to talk about it briefly. I'm sure people in 314 went over screening. Yes. I hope. Okay. So screening is a, like I say, it's a fairly mechanical process. The project is usually either in or out. In other words, in means it needs to go through an EA process or an EIA process. 
if it's out, it's because it's a very small project, very low chance of any kind of significant adverse impact. Yeah, well, I don't want to generalize too much, but most, any, any sort of project that you would probably think of that comes to mind, a mine, a dam, a wastewater treatment plant, anything that really uh, is a large environmental risk will, will be screened in. So when is a project reviewable? There's actually a regulation for that. I've pulled a couple of pieces from it so you don't have to look up the whole regulation, though you certainly can if you want. So this is from the BC EAO, which is the Environmental Assessment Office. And it's just a quick step to understand if a given project is reviewable, meaning it's screened in. So is the project in a prescribed category? So is it a mine, a dam, a large industrial project? Any of these things that's automatically in, you go straight to the reviewable box down at the bottom. In the case of uh, hydroelectric reservoirs, it's going to exceed a design threshold. So in this case, the design threshold is 50 megawatts. And in the case of Site C, it's 1100. So that's the end of the screening process. It's done. It's like super easy. And that's why I'm not going to talk anymore about it. So this is, again, as a sort of another general flow chart. And just want to point you to where we are. So we're sort of going through this, everything above this today. So you do a preliminary assessment uh, of both the receiving environment or the affected environment and the project itself, trying to understand at a high level just generally what are the risks that we need to worry about. You're not doing a risk assessment, you're just sort of flagging risks. And so then you can do a preliminary assessment and select your environmental parameters. So that means what is it we need to measure, what is it we need to assess. So that's kind of the scoping process in a nutshell. And now let's get into some detail. So once the screening process is complete, and you've confirmed that your project is reviewable, we need to answer these questions before we can move on. So what will the EIA address? Which components? What are the issues? Um, in a lot of cases, just knowing what type of project is gives you a long list of issues that you know you have to deal with. Uh, for example, a dam, you know you're going to be flooding land. You, you know that you're going to be removing some terrestrial resource, either from the general public or from some poor person who's about to have their land expropriated. You know that that's going to remove terrestrial habitat. You know that there's a risk that it's going to generate methylmercury. You know that it's going to change the hydrograph. All of these things, as soon as you know um, what type of project is, there's a bunch of issues that automatically come on the table. I'm actually going to skip down one bullet. The next part is what stakeholder consultation is required. And you want to do that really early because if you don't do it early enough, you come back to the scoping when you find out that there's something really important to your stakeholders that you didn't scope. So this is part of the scoping, ideally. Uh, another big one is what are the alternatives? And I hate to say it, but it's in, it's in Noble's book and he's right. The project alternatives are often an exercise in justifying the project. And that is also, it's partly intentional but partly not. Um, the, the way it's not intentional is that the proponent knows everything about their project, they know everything about what they want to do, but they don't know everything about <coughs> what's another alternative. So for example, BC Hydro would know everything about the Site C dam by the time the project goes to review, but they have to do all sorts of alternatives like build a coal power plant instead, natural gas, uh, solar, wind, and don't build it at all. They haven't evaluated any of those other alternatives in as much detail as their own. Even if they've done a proper and defensible alternatives assessment, there's just no way anybody's ever going to do a full assessment on, a, on an alternative. Um, otherwise, they're basically doing an EIA for 30 years. So that's just a practical reality. But you need to do enough rigor that you can actually compare some of the major features, costs and benefits. Uh, but at this stage in scoping, we're not really getting into detail about alternatives. We're basically just saying, what are all the different alternatives that we need to look into when we do the EIA? Um, this part does get set, though, during scoping. Spatial boundary and temporal boundary are very important. How big is our area that we need to assess and how long into the future or far into the past? And I'll talk about all of these in more detail. Um, so again, it should involve public participation. 
but the challenges here are we're time limited, we're data limited. We haven't actually done the baseline study yet, so we only have a general understanding of what the environment is. Um, and often we'll just use a matrix that kind of says, here's all the different possible effects, here's all the different um, uh, projects or whatever the matrix includes. Uh, can be a ranking of, is it a high, low, medium risk? But it's generally just some sort of a matrix that spells out what are the, what are the issues and what are the, um, what are the possible impacts and how bad might they be? But again, I say might. This is a very, very preliminary assessment. Now, the precautionary approach is to be over-inclusive. In other words, I don't think this will have any effect on the environment, but I couldn't really tell you because I don't have any data yet. We haven't done the EIA. So that's obviously not going to be very convincing to anybody. So often things get put into an EIA that don't really belong in there. And that's what Ross's paper highlights is that um, a lot of stuff gets added. When it gets added, obviously it's a huge cost to the proponent, but it's also a huge cost to all the stakeholders because they, they need to review that and they need to make sense of it. And often just having something in an EIA raises concerns because people think, oh, this is in here, it must be a big risk. So that, that's a challenge and so Ross has some nice commentary on that. So in, in the screening, or sorry, in the scoping process, some methods are, are uh, specified, but usually not the method, usually just the outcome. You must assess this VEC, but it doesn't say you must assess this VEC by monitoring and by completing such and such study. So at the end, we'll see a terms of reference that spells out all of the details that, that we're talking about here. So I just want to read a few quotes from Noble I thought were really good. Um, so again, Noble was that textbook I showed on slide two. So to consider all issues, impacts, and environmental components in any single EIA is neither feasible nor desir desirable. It's in nobody's best interest to generate reams of meaningless analysis. That seems pretty common sense, uh, but it's often, it's often not the case which is why Bill Ross wrote that paper in the first place. So scoping is about determining the important issues and parameters that should be addressed in the EIA, establishing the spatial and temporal boundaries, and focusing the assessment on the, relative, on the relevant issues and concerns. And I highlighted these because this is really the key to making a good EIA, is to come up with a good focused scope. And we want to make everything as relevant to both issues and concerns as possible. There's a lot of stuff that we can look at and say, this you know, is not a risk, um, we don't really need to assess it. The discussion then becomes who is the authority on what's a risk without having done all of that uh, detailed study. So do you listen to the expert who's done it three times? Or do you listen to the person who lives there who's about to have his land flooded? It's, um, it's, it's a difficult one. So this, this is really the crux of scoping is, is focusing and prioritizing. So which elements of the human and biophysical environment are at risk? These are the big questions we need to answer. How might environmental components change over time? That's a very difficult thing to answer because there are so many factors that can affect the future. Um, it's really difficult to predict, say, what a moose rangeland will look like 50 years from now with or without the project. Probably the biggest unknown that we have is who's going to form the next government and what will their policies be around industrial development, and we can't predict that. So it, it, it gets very difficult, but we have to do our best to make some prediction of how things would change over time. And again, that's where we need to lay out our assumptions. Some other big questions are what is, what is the interaction among components? And so uh, I'll use my favorite, water quality. Uh, that obviously relies entirely on the hydrology component. Uh, because the water flow completely affects how the water chemistry moves. And the human health relies on the water quality because how healthy that water is to drink depends entirely on metals and other constituents in the water. So all of these components have linkages and we need to make sure that we're being interdisciplinary and not multidisciplinary. In other words, we're working really closely with the other components. And then this may or may not be a big question depending on where you're working, but what is the interaction with other development activities? And so we're talking about cumulative effects. And in this case, for Site C, obviously there's two dams upstream, so we've got lots of interaction with existing developments. There's also a proposed 
dam just on the other side of the Alberta border called the Dunbagan Dam, which you might read about, um, and then another one near Peace River. So it's, uh, it, it's a big issue is cumulative effects, is how, how does this project affect the existing environment? How does it affect the existing environment considering existing developments? But also how does it affect the environment considering all the other projects that might one day be built in the future, or are likely to be built in the future. So, some, uh, some thoughts from Ross. Scoping is the process of identifying and assigning priority to the issues associated with the project. Again, emphasis on priority. That's my emphasis. Um, common sense, so his paper's all about common sense. If an impact will not influence the project decision, it's not appropriate to require that it be studied in an EIA designed to improve decision making. So, there is an exception to this that is a bit of a tricky one. And sometimes it actually does make sense to study an issue, even though you know it's not gonna be an issue, because every stakeholder in the region thinks it's an issue and you need to actually assess it to give them some comfort that it's not gonna be an issue. And so sometimes you actually do an assessment like that when you're, even when you're fairly sure of the outcome, uh, just to sort of uh, help give people comfort that it's been scientifically addressed and you're not just saying, I know it's not an issue, I've done this 30 times, and that is never gonna happen. So sometimes it's just about proving it. Um, so the tendency is for consultees, in other words, people who are consulted, to request and for TOR to require that proponents deal with everything under the sun. And I'm gonna come back to that. And this is a big one too. This, there's a tendency for participants to view their concerns as the most important. And that actually works both ways. That also applies to consultants and scientists like us, who scientists who have got a really specific background and we've studied caribou all our lives and we know that this could affect caribou. Caribou is gonna be the most important thing on earth to that person. And that, again, that's just human nature. Uh, but also, you know, somebody who lives downstream of a project often doesn't care about what's happening upstream or way far downstream, it's just all about that particular thing. And that, again, human nature. It's just something to be aware of. Some of the components of scoping now we'll go through in more detail. So there are two forms of alternatives to a project. There's an alternative means and an alternative to. So an alternative means is a fairly small modification to how something is done. An alternative means for a dam might mean slightly different generating capacity, uh, different, um, different dam height, slightly different location, fairly minor changes that may or may not affect the, uh, the outcome of the EIA. In other words, moving it further downstream might flood fewer properties, might remove less habitat, and so the proponent needs to show that they've considered alternative means. And then alternatives to the project are the types of things I talked about earlier. An alternative to the project is, we're not building this thing, we need to do something completely different. Um, often, the number one thing you assess is no project. So, if we don't do this, and you can read this in, in the Site C stuff, if we don't do this, we're gonna run out of power, and BC will have to pay super high premiums on electricity in 20 years. Um, so during scoping, alternatives are considered for detailed analysis. And it's really just about listing what, all are, what are those alternatives that will be assessed. And so an alternatives assessment really helps the decision maker. They need to look at the pros and cons, uh, not just the cost and benefit of a single project, but the pros and cons of this compared to a whole bunch of other alternatives. And again, we'll go over this in a lot more detail later. But for scoping, it's really just about listing all those things. So valued ecosystem components, I think this is probably the biggest topic of uh, scoping. This really affects everything. Um, or if I, if I refer to BC, which I'll probably do, I'll just call them VCs. So these are informed by public engagement, professional experience, analogous projects, which is a similar project that was hopefully in a similar environment where the project has been built. It's already been assessed. We've not just got their assessment, but we've got their post uh, construction monitoring and we can see what actually happened. We don't have to rely on some prediction. Um, a good one to look at is Churchill Dam. That went through a huge review recently. Um, or lower, lower, Churchill, lower Churchill, sorry. 
Uh, but there's a whole bunch of dams in Manitoba, Quebec, that have all been through these massive EA reviews and have been built, and now we actually have the data. So we have a really good understanding of what a dam does to the environment. Um, also informed by local geography and ecology, legislation. For example, if something is listed in the Species at Risk Act and it might be anywhere near your project, it better be a BC or at least covered by a BC. Um, um, and by the way, affecting one, of, affecting one single individual within a Species at Risk Act can be a significant adverse impact. So that's super important. Um, and then existing stressors, what's already happening in this environment where we're planning to do our development. And then sensitivity. Sensitivity is an important concept. Um, some species are very resilient to change, some are very sensitive to change. Um, we generally want to look at the most sensitive species. Um, there's a concept in risk assessment of really looking at that fifth percentile of the most sensitive species. So with any anything you can do to um, an ecological system, whether it's introduce pollutants, remove their rangeland, there's generally a, uh, a distribution of sensitivity to that stressor and we want to look at what are the most sensitive. And we're going to talk about that later in the semester, uh, about species sensitivity distributions. And so there's, again, on the right, some information from the BC EAO, uh, but I'll let you read that later if you haven't already. And again, I'm not going to read these in detail, but this is sort of, this is from Noble. These are just some generic lists of the different types of VCs or VECs that we might want to look at, depending on whether or not it's relevant to our project. So for example, we're in Kelowna. We probably don't care too much about the coastal zone. Um, depending on where we are and what the issues are, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, housing really comes down to where your worker's going to live. Um, there's lots of these that you look at and you go, that's really not an issue. But then there's a lot of these that you go, you know, these are definite issues. It's the ones that are sort of in between where there's a struggle, where you go, okay, we're going to assess this. We're going to spend two years studying the field uh, data. We're going to spend another year or two doing a giant assessment. Uh, it, do we really need to? Okay, and so here's some guidance. This is, so this is, from a guidance document, I think. So this is the this is the type of information that you'll see in a guidance document. So this this is not a law. There's nothing. If you don't follow this, you can't get punished. But if you don't follow it, the government's going to send it back and say, you know, your your VCs are not relevant or they're not measurable. You've listed a whole bunch of things that we don't even know how to measure. We can't assess this. So go back to the drawing board. Uh, but I like their I like their attributes that they've listed. So obviously it has to be relevant. It has to be practical and measurable. If we can't go out and measure it, we can't assess it, really. Particularly if we can't measure it after the project's built. Uh, that's a key point, is you need to be able to go back and verify this. Because if we make some sort of prediction about what might happen to the environment, uh, if the government's doing their job properly, they will put some conditions in place that says, after this is built, we approve it, after it's built, proponent will monitor this, 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 and this at this frequency and report to us. And they'll be very specific at that point about how we're going to go back and measure everything that we've assessed to know if we're right. So that it's not just about being right, it's also about um, are we actually protecting the environment? Can we rely on our assessment? There's a, there's a whole bunch of reasons why you go out and monitor after a project is built. Um, it needs to be accurate and predictable. So if it's something that we care about, that's important, that is at risk, but it's totally unpredictable, uh, there's not really much point in doing the assessment. And so Noble lays out pretty much the same list, but there, he laid out a few more that I really like. Uh, your VECs must be understandable to non-scientists. So if I make a VEC uh, turbidity, some people might understand that, um, if I make it uh, methyl mercury concentrations, probably nobody, none of the general public will actually understand what is a good uh, concentration of methyl mercury. Uh, but if I make it number of moose uh, within a certain range, most people understand that. If I make it uh, um, safe for humans, or if I can put some measurable metric of a safe for human threshold on something, it, it's some, something that's relatable because in the end, 
the public has to at least trust that we've done our job properly and they can follow what we've done. Even if they disagree, they have to be able to, number one, uh, understand and, and trust uh, our work. Cost effective is an interesting one. That's kind of debatable, but I'm glad Noble put it in there. And then useful for informing decisions, which is actually probably the most important on, most important thing on here. If your VEC or really any other part of your scoping is something that is not going to lead to a better decision, it shouldn't be in there. So it has to be um, something that can inform a decision. And so for scoping VECs or VCs, uh, this is again from the BC Assessment Office. Um, this applies to each VC, although it can be done on multiple at once if they're very similar. Uh, but as the process goes, uh, you need first to select your value component, establish the boundaries. And so here is where um, it can get tricky to have 30 different VCs, each with their own boundaries. I'll talk a bit more about that when I talk about spatial boundaries, but um, there's definitely some pros and cons of doing everything at once versus doing these individually. But it does need to be laid out for each one in the end, whether you do them concurrently or sequentially. Um, so here's, here's another guidance document. This is all about um, how to select, select VCs. So as you're doing your report and looking at um, what other assessments have done, it would be good to look at this and see if they follow this guidance. See if they actually did it according to the guidance document. Because it's not always done according to the guidance document. You can do things differently if you consult properly in advance with both the stakeholders and the government and say, we've got your guidance document, it looks pretty good, but because our project is slightly different, we need to scope this differently. Again, you, you just have to do that consultation in advance. Um, but so, as, as I said, so a lot of the stuff we're talking about here is actually laid out in this document um, in terms of how to go about uh, choosing all of the, the, the VCs and the boundaries and everything. Just a lot of considerations. Most of them are in this presentation, but I would recommend looking at this document at some point for more detail. Uh, so spatial boundaries, this is always interesting. So they can be different for each VC. Uh, that's just a necessity because different VCs will have a different set of issues. Uh, for example, trans transport of pollutants, and that applies to air and water usually. So if you have a smokestack, how far do those pollutants go? The answer is infinitely far, depending on the pollutant. If you're emitting mercury, it's going up into the atmosphere and it's going to stay there forever until it comes down as precipitation. So that's a problem. So it's tough to put a spatial boundary on that. Greenhouse gases, your spatial boundary is essentially the planet uh, or the atmosphere. Um, and so there are some that are essentially global issues that they, they disperse everywhere. Uh, but then there's uh, much simpler ones. If you are discharging something to a river, it follows a very predictable trajectory. And again, it will go forever till it hits the ocean. Um, but with that, it's much easier to do an assessment that says, you know, beyond two kilometers downstream, you won't be able to detect it anymore. So we can put a boundary there. And again, that's an assumption. We need to lay out that assumption. And people will come back and say, well, you think that it's two kilometers, but really, <coughs> It could be 10, so your boundary should be 10 kilometers. And the trade-off here is that the larger our area, the less detail we can look at of any component within that area. Uh, so wildlife, they move on their own. Some are fairly stationary. Some have huge ranges. Um, same with fish. Uh, fish swim upstream, unfortunately. It makes them difficult to assess. Um, an air shed. Uh, normally, if it's not a global pollutant or basically a something that turns into a gas when it's emitted. Um, generally, there's a pretty good definition. Air quality scientists can make a decent prediction about which, what's the predominant uh, direction it's going to blow in. But of course, the wind blows in all directions. It's not like, it doesn't behave nicely like a river. Um, and under those circumstances, how far will this plume go before it's essentially not measurable? Or how far will the plume go before everything is below any sort of meaningful threshold? Land disturbance, that's usually pretty straightforward. Something like noise, usually pretty straightforward. We can hear things 
whatever kilometer from our site, so we'll just draw a circle of kilometer around our site. That's fairly straightforward. Um, but often there are practical limitations, especially at the scoping stage. Once we're into the assessment, we have a lot better definition. We can actually make predictions about how far things went. Uh, but at that point, if we need to change our scope, we're in for a lot of rework. We might have to go back and start our baseline study over again if we haven't um, set our, our, our spatial boundaries properly. And again, that's a huge issue because the next thing after this is go out and collect data, usually for about two years. It can be one year, it can be five years, but two years is a pretty general rule about how long a baseline is done for. So yeah, if you haven't scoped it properly, you haven't probably measured your entire study area, and now you're back to the drawing board. Consistency is preferable um, or critical for some related components. I mentioned hydrology and water quality. If those components don't have the same study area, it's virtually impossible to do your water quality study. But there are some that just don't, even though they're very closely related, they don't have the same study domains. So consistency is preferable, not always possible. And then I should mention that usually there's a local study area and a regional study area. These are often arbitrary, they have to be, uh, because we don't know in advance exactly what the project effects are. So if we make it too big, we cause too much work. If we make it too small, we miss something. And uh, the worst case scenario, obviously, would be that we miss something. It never gets assessed. And then there's an adverse effect that nobody saw coming. So that is absolutely the worst case scenario. So temporal boundaries. How long could project effects occur? Um, I'll start with the easy part of this. Usually, uh, we have fairly well-defined project um, schedules. So there will usually be a construction period, an operations period, uh, early, rec early reclamation, and a closure and sort of a walk away, which is what uh, most proponents want in the end, is to be able to reclaim the land to the point where the government will issue a certificate and they can walk away, which means everything's totally hunky-dory according to the government. Um, that happens um, in far too many cases. A lot of projects start out thinking they're going to be this temporary uh, project that removes some land from, um, from the natural environment or from the, from the public uh, lands uh, for 20 or 30 years, and in the end, they miss something. I have a great example of that, actually. Um, does anybody know of Brenda Mines? So you pass it if you're driving to Vancouver. Um, if you're driving to Vancouver about 30 kilometers west of West Kelowna, you'll come to this big corner as you're still kind of going up the connector, and off to your left you'll see this giant flat, what looks like a mountain that's been completely shaved flat. It's actually a tailings dam. And on the other side of that, is a giant open pit that wasn't reclaimed properly. And again, I'll, I'll tell you a little anecdote. Um, in 1996, I was studying water quality here, and we did a field trip to Brenda Mines. And I remember standing on the edge of the pit, and it's just a giant uh, uh, open pit. I think it's about 300 meters deep, and probably 500 meters across. So it's this giant pit. And it's the first time I had ever been on a mine site. And so I remember the awe of, holy cow, humans actually built this thing. Uh, but so it was starting to fill with water. The mine had been closed. It was a molybdenum mine. And it was starting to fill with water. And they were just starting to measure the water concentrations. There was no EIA. EIAs didn't exist when Brenda Mines was built, which is the case with a lot of legacy projects. Um, nobody had done an EIA. They hadn't even thought about closure until the mine was done. That was kind of the mindset back then, mine, 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 or develop, 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 or whatever it is until you're done and then get the hell out of there. And so back in those days, we were, so this is in the 90s, we were just starting to sort of realize EIAs had been around for maybe a decade that there's a lot of legacy projects out there that we're now gonna have to deal with where nobody had ever even thought about closure, and this was one of them. So we got a tour from the environmental manager there, and she was telling us about how the lake is starting to fill with water, they've been measuring concentrations, and it's high in molybdenum. And I don't, I don't know if I'd even heard of molybdenum at that point, but it was a molybdenum mine, so it makes sense. There's ore high in molybdenum, it's gonna leach into the water. 
Uh, but the big problem there is that the outflow from the lake, once it was going to fill, would flow into Trepanya Creek, which is uh, in Peachland, flows down into Peachland. And there's a lot of agriculture. And um, ungulates, uh, so any sort of moose, cows, uh, ruminants, uh, molybdenum is very toxic to them. Um, it's, molybdenum is the only chemical that's more toxic to terrestrial species than aquatic species. So it's a very unique uh, chemical. Uh, but the concentrations in, in the lake were high enough that there was almost certainly going to be uh, adverse effects to any uh, wildlife and agricultural uh, cows or whatever that, that drink from this water if it was allowed to be released. So at this point, we're standing on the edge of the pit. Everyone, or they knew there's a huge problem, and they said, well, you know what, the good news is we have 10 years to figure this out because we kind of know how long it's going to take this pit to fill from some from some hydrogeological, I don't know if they had a model or some experts just doing Darcy's Law stuff, but they, they kind of estimated this is going to take 10 years to fill, so we can figure this out. And I didn't think about it again for at least 15 years. I, uh, at that point, I was starting to work on pit lakes. I've made that kind of the focus of my career for a long time. And I thought, hey, you know what? I never did find out what happened to random mines. So I looked it up, and unfortunately, they didn't figure it out. So they have a water treatment plant there, it's designed for three, they're going to treat it for 300 years. That's their plan. But having made predictions that far in the future myself, I know that that 300 years could mean 50 years or it could mean forever. It could mean 3,000 years. There's really no way to put a number on something that long. And so I went and toured it again last year. They had a conference uh, on mine reclamation and they made that the tour. And sure enough, they've got this water treatment plant. The water treatment plant has now been there for 10 years and it's at the end of its life and they have to replace it. So unfortunately, the mitigation for this mine is going to be have a fence around it and have a water treatment plant that needs to be replaced every 10 years for basically in perpetuity. The, the reason that's kind of important is, so we often make predictions like that. Uh, it's going to take 300 years. It's going to take 100 years. It doesn't matter. If it's going to take more than a generation or two, it's forever. Not only can you not make a prediction that is precise after that long, but nobody cares. If, if somebody's re reading this EIA and says, I can't go on this land for 50 years, that, that's really not much comfort. Um, so any of these long-term predictions, they're really difficult to make, uh, but they're super important because if we get them wrong, it's, it's, it's forever. Uh, so that was a real kind of eye-opener for me working with pit lakes, seeing that this one that I sort of had this connection to is a disaster that's going to be treated forever. Um, but it's, it's good to keep those things in mind. We learn a lot from past disasters. So again, we would like to bound the time frame. In some cases, we can. So noise. Noise is a great example. Once the construction and the operations are gone, the noise is gone. It's nice and clean and easy. Um, but anything that puts some contaminant into the environment, uh, if it's a persistent contaminant, it might be forever. Uh, particularly um, with a large-scale uh, terrestrial contamination. Uh, aquatic contamination is not great, but the kind of benefit of it is that it will clean itself up because water flows. If you've contaminated all your sediments, all your land, um, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a bad situation. So we want to be able to make accurate predictions so that we can predict that in the, worst, in the first case. So back to these snapshots, often we, we will look at these and say, what's the worst case scenario for this snapshot? What's the worst thing that can happen during construction? What's the worst thing that can happen during operations? And what's the worst thing that can happen during closure and reclamation? I will maybe just throw some detail around these terms. They're not very precise, but usually closure is the period where uh, some industrial development is still there, but they're actively cleaning themselves up. They're dismantling all their infrastructure, they're revegetating, they're doing all that mine closure or dam closure or whatever it is. And once they're done, that's either the reclamation closure or the post closure. There's different terms for it, but they're very distinct periods. One is the land is now here, hopefully self-sustaining and no more contamination issues. And one is we're actively working on cleaning this up. 
This becomes very important for legacy projects. Um, there's a couple of mines northwest. There's the Faro Mine and the Giant Mine. So those are other mines that were uh, abandoned, essentially opened, uh, opened 50 or more years ago. Uh, so back when nobody knew or cared about environmental regulations, the mining companies went in, mined, uh, polluted, and left. And so now the federal government is on the hook for them. So both Faro and Giant. Giant Mine, by the way, um, its claim to fame is that it has enough arsenic trioxide on site to kill every human being on Earth. So that's, that's the Giant Mine's claim to fame. There's actually some good documentaries on that one. It's a really crazy story. They, they had a huge... Uh, they had roasters, and they put a whole bunch of arsenic up into the air, and they really, really polluted Yellowknife badly, because that's the issue with aerial, aerial deposition. It goes up, it comes down. It's really hard to find out where it came down, how much of it, because it gets mixed with sediments, and so then people have a garden. They're eating arsenic because nobody knew that was there. It's, it's, a, it's a real, really bad situation. So the closure, in this case, we're going to be, we Canadians, are going to be paying to close the giant mine for many, many, many years. And the ferro mine, and a whole bunch of other ones. But those are the two worst ones in Canada. Uh, so stakeholder consultation. As I mentioned, it's extremely important. Usually, um, well, first I'll, I'll kind of list what the stakeholders are. I'm not sure if I've gone over that. But the proponent is a stakeholder, but they're usually not included in what we refer to as stakeholders. Uh, government, indigenous communities, um, I would say that uh, in EIA, if you don't make both of these parties completely satisfied, uh, you're not getting approved, period. The general public, NGOs, and neighboring affected industries are important. I'm not saying one's more important to the other, but I am saying that as a practical matter, these two are really the only ones that matter for getting approved. Unfortunately, it's actually kind of sad. The general public actually doesn't matter that much in terms of having input into a major project decision. NGOs, there's a lot of NGOs that have varying degrees of influence. They show up at hearings, they write statements of concern on EIAs. Sometimes the government listens to them. The thing is that they're not decision makers, uh, but what they can do is they can flag issues that sometimes they will pick up on something that nobody else did, or they can get public support, or political support, which then means the government now cares about it. So that's the really, um, the big benefit to NGOs. They can spend a lot, they spend a lot of time, they're very passionate, they care about a lot of things, and really when they can get something on the government's radar, then it, now it's a big, uh, now it's a big issue. And then neighboring or affected industries, generally neighboring or affected industries don't put up too much of a protest against a new industry, but there's certainly stakeholders that you can have an effect on if you're an industry, um, particularly in the case of cumulative effects, uh, but also using resources. Uh, there's a lot of socioeconomic impacts that come along with having a lot of developments. If uh, the oil sands are a great example, there's seven mines um, that fly people in and out, so there's huge socioeconomic impacts that need to be considered. Anytime you have a work camp and adding another 5,000 person work camp to a 35,000 person work camp area is a big issue for socioeconomics. So municipalities care about transient workers. All the industry around the municipality is concerned about overstre overstressing the resources. So that's, that's usually where neighboring or affected industries can sometimes put up some resistance. Also, if there's um, this, this concept does not apply too much in Canada. It's big in the United States, it's called the total maximum daily load, and that's how pollutants are managed. So in the States, it's done sometimes in Canada, but not much. Um, they'll look at a river or a sh an air shed, and they'll back calculate from there using sort of safe thresholds, how much can actually be uh, deposited into this environmental system before we exceed a threshold. <coughs> And then what they'll do is they'll take that total amount that can be, as it's termed, loaded. <coughs> so loading is basically any kind of discharge, a mass discharge. And they'll divide that up into um, however many indus industrial players there are. It really comes into effect a lot in like 
eastern USA where it's super populated. There's a million different industries with discharges and there's agriculture and there's all sorts of other things going on and the government needs to sort of put a bound on each one. And so what they'll do is they'll divvy it up and say, okay, um, you can pollute up to 10 tons of sulfur per year, whatever the number is, and you can pollute up to 20. So when that happens, now there's a fixed amount that industry has to share. If more industry players come on board, all the other industries have to lower their discharges, which means adding mitigation, which means adding cost. And so industries sometimes will go up and say, look, there's no more room for this new player to come into our region. It's just, we're, we're full. So there's some really weird things in there, but they're, they're very different stakeholders. They're, they almost never uh, intervene on behalf of the environment, for example. So what normally happens, uh, not always, but normally if it's a large company, they'll have special teams for consultation, people who do it all their lives for a living, and they will hire subject matter experts, which could be anybody in this room. Uh, whatever your subject matter is, they hire you as an expert to not just do the assessment, but sometimes to come along to consultations because they want somebody who can explain in detail um, how was this assessed, um, how will it be assessed, how do we have confidence that there's no impact, if there is an impact, how large is that, what's the magnitude, duration, all of that stuff, what do we mean by significant. Usually companies will have sort of their own consultation where just the company goes and they try and gather input from stakeholders and then they'll come back and they'll bring the experts uh, to talk in detail about whatever they heard in that first round of consultation. So um, if Brenda Mines was being reclaimed, they would consult with the city of Peachland, probably on their own. They would come back then with their molybdenum expert to explain all the things that they didn't really um, cover in the first meeting. So that's usually the scientist's role. Um, although a lot of the people who do consultation are scientists, it's just that they've kind of switched gears and started doing something different. Um, so communicating with the public can be very challenging. The reason it's challenging is because we want to be as precise as possible. We want to use very precise terms. We want to be as accurate as possible. We don't want to be vague. We don't want to be uh, ambiguous in any way, shape, or form because we lose our credibility if we are, but when you're sort of getting out of technical language, you're also moving away from precision. Um, you're using less precise terms that have different meanings, and it's really difficult to uh, communicate something that's highly technical to non-technical people. So again, I, I talked a little bit about using jargon earlier. If you use jargon, not only can people not understand you, but then they don't trust you, and that's kind of the worst case scenario. Okay, so once scoping is finished, we need to have a terms of reference. And the terms of reference is really just a documenta uh, documentation of the scoping outcome. Not the whole scoping process, but the outcome. In the end, we have a list of what needs to be measured, where, um, not necessarily how, but for how long, um, what needs to be assessed in the end, what are our VCs, what's their range, what's the local study area, what's the regional study area, um, all of these details. On this slide I'm showing two different tables of concordance and I'll just mention that both of these are linked on Canvas and you should take some time to go through these because they'll be very important both to your understanding of how an EIA is put together in terms of scope but also because I'm showing the site CEIS guidelines, which will be something you'll want to evaluate for your project. So I'll start with the document on the right. As you can see, this is a 2020 document, so it's fairly new and it corresponds to the 2018 Environmental Assessment Act. And so let's go through this document really quickly just to kind of look at what's inside. Essentially, this is a generic document which will be made very specific for each project, but it's a starting point that the government will use to set the terms of reference or what they're now calling the application information requirements for any given EIA or EA. So they start with an overview of the project, regulatory framework, public engagement, looking at engagement with governments, but then getting into valued component selection, which is something we just talked about. You need to describe the methods that you've used to come up with your VCs but the bulk of this is going to be spent on the valued components effects assessment. And as you can see, the document lays out a number of generic 
uh, technical disciplines, which may or may not be applicable. And so if they're not applicable, for example, again, I'll use the marine example for, say, an assessment in Kelowna. We don't have a marine environment, so that section would not be applicable at all. But uh, there are lots of other technical disciplines in here that you would need to evaluate as a practitioner to determine if it's applicable to your specific EA. Now, this is a relatively new document, and it has been refocused a little bit compared to the older version. The older version was much more focused on specific technical disciplines. So it was multidisciplinary, but not as interdisciplinary. So this is an improvement from previous versions. This document also has a lot more focus on Indigenous nations. So for example, you can see section 11 of this document focuses on Indigenous nations. And for any given project, the proponent would need to fill out a section 11 for every nation that is potentially affected by their project. And then the document also focuses on uh, biophysical factors, human and community well-being, as opposed to having health as a specific component. So this really does take a more holistic view of these components so that the VCs then feed into health and well-being as opposed to just being standalone technical disciplines. The other document that I'm going to show you fairly quickly here, and I'll let you go through this on your own, is the Site C Energy Project EIS Guidelines. So the EIS Guidelines is essentially the older version of what is now known as the Application Information Requirements, also known more generically as a Terms of Reference. So this uh, EIS Guideline document spells out exactly what BC Hydro was tasked with in terms of setting their environmental impact assessment. And so this goes through line by line. It's kind of a checklist that BC Hydro needed to complete. And so as part of your project, uh, you should look at what the EIS guidelines specified for your technical discipline, and then try and evaluate whether or not BC Hydro and their consultants had properly filled the terms of reference. And so you can see it's, it's laid out by discipline and any discipline that has a technical appendix, which will be the focus of your project, will be covered by these EIS guidelines. So again, those are both linked from Canvas under Lecture 5, right underneath where this lecture will be linked. Okay, so here I'm going to come back to Ross's paper. So he referred to everything under the sun as a 60-page terms of reference and 6,000 pages of assessment report. Oh, those were the nice days. So the site C... The EIS guidelines, which is the terms of reference, is over twice as long as his Everything Under the Sun, and the EIA is four times as long as his Everything Under the Sun. So, believe it or not, he, I think he wrote that paper about 10 years ago. This is becoming the new normal for any kind of large project. It's just 25,000, and, and proponents love to talk about, oh, we generated 30,000 pages. We, we generated 25,000 pages. Do you want us to do more? But seriously, <laughs> they are pretty long. So. That to me seems like the new norm is everything under the sun. The reason I'm showing that is because if you are working on one of these projects, you want to spend a lot of time going through that table of concordance and making sure that it's really necessary to include something. I've been, I've been shocked at some of these before that virtually everything in that table ends up in there, no matter what. Okay, so I showed this table before. I just wanted to bring it back now to kind of relate technical studies to valued components. So. I know everyone has looked at this because it was in the first lecture and everybody chose something off of it. Um, but there's a difference between technical studies and valued components. So a technical study is really sort of what does this one expert look at within their scope. Um, the valued components are what is it we're assessing in the end. And sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're not. So for example, sometimes water quality is the VC. We just care about good water quality. So Sometimes thermal and ice regime is the VC. But again, those aren't very measurable. So they have to relate to something people care about. This is a much better system, although it's more complicated to work on. But as you can see, fish and fish habitat and human health, and, uh, human health they each have seven different technical studies that they rely on. So in the end, somebody's got to go and incorporate or integrate all of the information generated by each of these technical studies. And if they haven't been working in a really integrated way all along, 
you're going to come up with seven different reports that just don't fit together and you can't do the assessment in the end. Um, for example, if, if the methylmercury team and the thermal regime and the surface water regime all had different study areas, all had different temporal boundaries, how do you know how to put that together? It's just integration of all of this information is really, really key. That's why I talked about project management first, because it's the project manager's job to make sure that all of those components are well integrated. 